Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I guess we start. Uh, I still see people coming in, but uh, they will catch up. We are, I'm Swiss, so we are used to punctual starts. So first, who am I? I'm Bastian. Um, I go by Das Recht on Twitter and every medium I can find. If you want to more, know more about me, you find me on bastianwittmer.ch. Um, in the Drupalverse, I um, work in the Modernizing Testbot Initiative, Drupal CI. Um, I help there out whenever, whatever tasks I can do. Um, they told me that I need to write down what I, my job title is, and I'm the chief you only live once operations evangelist. So I'm that person who tells your customer not to use um, Git or something, and I also tell them to, that you deploy on Friday afternoon right before you go off for weekend. That's my job. Of course, I'm not doing that, but it's like, that's what we do. So we have a quite dense program today. Um, I start with a little introduction. Um, then we go over to the ELK stack. I cover the architecture of the ELK stack a little bit. Um, then I head over to tools because there are many tools you can chain together. And if you get started with Elasticsearch, it's really a good start. And I try to make it as easy as possible for you. There's also some automation I'll cover. And I invented the number name P22N for uh, performance optimization just because it's too bothersome to write it down every time I just say P22N. So visualizing log files, why? Um, Michael, who sits in the front row here, told me, like, hey, can you check the errors from yesterday between 1502 and 1507? It's like, OK. Um, are you kidding me? The second, um, the second uh, action I had was that. I got all the log files together and started to grab and chain tools together on the bash, and I got a file, and then I just removed the stuff I don't want to see. And it was like, yeah, I had a file, but was it really what I ser wasn't searching for? And the next question would be like, oh, um, yeah, and can you go two minutes before what you just did? And then the whole process started again. So what I say is visualization is better than plain text. All right? All right. So that's what we deployed a patch some weeks ago. And basically, that graph you see is the error rate of our web servers all the time. And you see exactly when I deploy the patch, the error rate goes down, everybody is happy, and we know that we fixed an issue. So in my opinion, visualization is much better than plain text. Actually, it should look like this. Who of you is grabbing through log files sometimes? Who hates it? Oh, yeah. So welcome to my session. Um, so. Do you lock your watchdog messages to the database? Who does it? That's good. Um, that's OK if you have one site. If you have 70 sites logging a lot of data all the time to the database, you get a lot of database traffic, which is basically unnecessary. And what happens if you want to have a log file, which was already, or watchdog messages, which is already truncated? It's like, yeah, OK, it's gone. Um, so for those use cases or for Elasticsearch, there are a lot of use cases. For example, client calls you and say, hey, you deleted page whatever on my website. And then you say, OK, let me just fire up Elasticsearch. And you do an audit trail who deleted which page. And you see, oh, um, it's your user which deleted it. So um, I'm sorry, it was you. You just click delete. Um, it's also good to know when was a certain module enabled or disabled, or when did it yield an error. Um, also, what I told you earlier is the, the drop in the errors. You can just see things without like counting, OK, we had an hour ago, we had 1,000 messages, and now we have 500. That means it's like it gets more tangible to see what you're doing. Billing is also a use case. Um, for our customers, we bill them by hits. 
So if you DDoS them, we get more money. Um, it's easier just to have all the data in one system and say, give me all the hit data from one month and give me a number. So that's what we are trying to do. You can also do quite fancy things, and that's something I saw last week at the Elasticsearch meetup. Um, they inject in their error logs like application speed, or they do deep inspection on the IP addresses. So they have somehow a service which checks if it's a Tor node which was connecting or a normal node, or they can distinguish at some point with some JavaScript if it's a bot which is visiting the website or if it's a human and they just pass it along to the server access log, and then they can run data analytics on it. It was a job website, so they are keen to know how people access it. That's also why they check if people are accessing it via Tor. So in our office, it looks like this. Um, we have a video wall, and one screen is totally dedicated to showing the stats of the server, like the, the total count of errors. You see when there is a sudden spike, you just see it. It's like you know that the usual error rate is around 200 messages, and if you see a sudden spike, you just go in and check, and you see, ah, there was a deployment, there was a Drush CCL running at that time, and that yielded some errors, or there was a cron job which failed. It's just more tangible just to look at something, and it's easier for the human brain to interpret a graph rather than some text. So heading over to Elasticsearch, who is using it? There are quite a few. Who plans to use it soon? Great, wonderful. So the ELK stack is the short name for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. One small side note first, things move still fast. That's a slide I did earlier when in the beginnings of Elasticsearch with like, if you just didn't catch up two weeks, you just missed five versions of Elasticsearch. And it was like, okay, now I need to update and you read through everything. So try to keep up with the speed of the project and it will never fail you. Also updates got quite a lot easier and I'll cover that. So if you start now, you don't have the steep learning curve I had some years ago when you just, it was just three different products and you could put them on a server and lace it together with duct tape and shoelaces. So first, Elasticsearch. Um, Elasticsearch is uh, a Java application, which now fears like 50% of the room, and the other 50% say, okay, that's nice. Um, it does search and indexing. And it's a, dis it's a distributed system. So it, you can say, I want to have copies, and you can say you want to have shards. I'll cover that later on. It's also made to be clustered. So there is the send discovery, or send disco, how they call it, which is you just say the server, when you want to do a cluster, you just say, hey, your cluster 01, and you just drop in another node, which is also cluster 01, and they just discover each other by shouting into the network, I'm cluster one, who is also one, uh, who wants to be in, uh, in the cluster, and they just start to do their thing then. It's really cool, it's also really painful if just somebody else starts up a server in the same network and has the same cluster identification in a lab, for example, and then your cluster is doing strange things and then shards are replicated and it, he takes it down or goes, um, goes home after work and then your cluster is broken and you're like, why? Yeah, that's the fun thing about it. Um, the whole thing, Elasticsearch, you can call it over a JSON API and it has a really good REST interface. So you can do everything over curl requests and you can automate a lot of things, like also failovers and stuff. The indexing part is done by the Apache Lucene uh, project, so they use that library. And one interesting thing, which you should all be aware of, it does disk-based shard allocation. So if you have more than one server, it always tries to move the data there to a server which has the least disk uh, used. So it tries to save it from yourself that you just under-provision your disks, and it tries to just move data around. If you crash it with a lot of data, it will still fail. So you need to do something about it. 
I talked about indexes, replica, and shards. So an index, you can envision it like a database. And a replica is, you just say, I want to have one database, and I ha want to have four copies of it. And Elasticsearch then says, um, OK, I have just one server, and it creates one index. And it tries to create four replicas, but it says then, OK, um, I'm just one server. I can't like do whatever you told me. And it will then just show the cluster state red, unless you drop in four more servers. And then it will allocate the shards and sync everything. Uh, sorry, uh, allocate the replicas. And then it will say, OK, I'm green again. I'll cover that later. And the shard is an instance of Apache Lucene. So if you want to index data, you need to have some shards running. If you see the data isn't indexed as fast as you want to have it, you can just add more shards. The important thing about this is when you create an index database, um, you need to say how many replicas you want. That's something you can change afterwards. If you want to change the shards, you can't do it. You can just say once how many shards you want to have. Since we are doing um, daily rollovers, which I also take on later, it's not a big deal. If you see, okay, it's not okay today, you just ramp up the shards tomorrow and it will then roll over. So how does Elasticsearch look like? When you request Elasticsearch, you just start the Java, uh, the char, and it says, okay, I'm running on port 9200, and you just type that in, it looks like this. It's like, okay, I'm the Elasticsearch instance number three, I'm on cluster one, and it says which build this is, and the tagline, you know, for search. Um, that's like, okay, that's the, the first impression you get, and it's like, okay, what can I do with it? So there are a lot of front ends, which are also just basically, it's a bunch of HTML and JavaScript, and they can do um, REST requests, REST API requests to Elasticsearch. So that's one plugin. Um, and you can see I have several databases, like Logstash with a date. And you see the, the, green, um, the green boxes are actually the shards. So the green ones are the active one. The, um, the lighter green ones are the inactive ones. So if you just pull a server out, it tries to rebalance, unless it can. So, uh, do that successfully. So talking about this, this is an Elasticsearch plugin. Um, the Elasticsearch plugin system came in lately, not, not that lately, but it was early in the days you just copied it somewhere, you had some files, and it was not bundled with Elasticsearch. Now you can just say bin plugin install and then run the plugin name, and it will install it and give you back the, um, the name. So it's much easier because it's with Elasticsearch, and Elasticsearch has the plugins bundled. So speaking of that, who run a Elasticsearch instance publicly? Yeah, <laughs> it was fun. So speak with me. I will hereby solemnly swear I will never, ever expose an Elasticsearch, to pop, uh, Elasticsearch server to public. And never, ever. Just don't do it. Well, it has been fixed, the issue, but back in the days, you could load binaries. And yeah, we had, like, I'm a bad uh, example for talking about security in Elasticsearch because our server did a lot of damage in the internet. Um, so basically, somebody could upload a bash script and just run it, and it was a botnet. And uh, yeah, our Ethernet link on that server was saturated quite a bit. So they took our server down, and we were like, yeah, why? And you just don't get that they come in over Elasticsearch, uh, because there is no error logging. And so. so that feature has been defaulting to uh, disabled now since some versions. Um, there is Elasticsearch Shield, which is a security layer for Elasticsearch. It's a paid subscription feature, so I'm not covering that because I don't get a license from them. I asked them and said, hey, I would love to do a talk, but they said no. So Elasticsearch security on the cheap. Um, run it bound to localhost or in an internal network and just do an SSH tunnel. 
easy as that. So that's how most of our developers are working. Some have the VPN which they can access it directly. Um, but that works pretty well. Never had issues with it. Um, you can also, if you have the, the screens yeah, you saw earlier, you can just create a, a SSH session on boot and then you're in. That's just the easy way to, to uh, circumvent that you need to have it publicly. You can also do um, a really easy thing. You can use Nginx and some authentication. You, probably you authenticate against um, uh, some authentications over in your company and you set a cookie and then you just let traffic through if you have the authentication cookie. That's also another way, but that works out for us. Another feature, um, that's a thank me later. Um, there is, if you get up late at night because your Elasticsearch server doesn't have any disk space, um, you just delete some indexes. And uh, I did the start thingy and suddenly I had quite a lot of space. So that was fun. Um, well, all the data was gone too. So um, you can disable the really destructive calls like the globbing that you can perform actions on all indexes. You can disable them and I strongly suggest to do so. Um, another feature um, they have uh, or Elastic is providing is Marvel. So if you run a really big distributed system of Elasticsearch instances, um, you should look into it. It's also currently free because they are developing it, but as soon as it's finished, they will just um, make you pay for it. So I didn't look that much into it, but it looks, it's like stats, you can just look at it and it's nice to see how you just in, enter data and you see where the data flows through. So that's, my, that's fun, but that's all. So the next thing is Logstash. So one question is, did the Catalan citizens invent Logstash because I saw something like that this morning. So you see next slide, that's the Logstash. So they look pretty, you see? They look pretty same. So no, they didn't. Um, Logstash itself, you can think about it like a multiple input, multiple output system. It can take nearly everything that is text or is a buffer or a file, something you can just feed into it, then you can do a lot of processing and you can just throw it out again. That's the, the easy way of understanding what Logstash is. Um, you can collect data, um, you can parse data, you can also say like, uh, I don't want to have this data. If you have a, a debug flag in your log line, you can just say debug and if you go into Logstash, you can just drop it. And you can store it or you can forward it. So it's either an endpoint in your system or it's a throughput system. I'll go a bit more into detail now. So the life of an event. Something is written to, for example, um, Watchdog. Watchdog sends that request to Syslog and Syslog sends it to the input of our Elasticsearch, uh, of our Logstash, sorry. And then we do some filtering because it's just a log line. We need to break it up. We don't, we don't need to have the, the system name where it was relayed through. We want to see what's the client website's name, what's the error, which user was triggering the error because that's a really neat information to have when you know customer calls you and says, I can't save, no, whatever. And you can just say, okay, give me everything from this user and you see the errors. That's something really cool. You can run it by codec, so it, it change, a codec changes how some data is, is represented. So you can, for example, take a codec which is Ruby debug and you have a, a log line and it creates a, a JSON, a readable JSON file for you or a JSON output. And you have the output, so you can feed your data into a file or send it to Redis or send it to S3, for example. So yeah, that's it. So Logstash is JRuby. If you want, really want to know why it's JRuby, there is a link down there, and I will distribute the slides later on. Um, Jordan Zissel, who created Logstash, uh, goes there. It was a GitHub issue, and he just 
wrote up a really big gist um, why he is using um, JRuby. So don't worry about that. Side note here, since everything later than version 1.4, we're now at 1.7.1, it's just a flat char. It just can run the char. Earlier it was like Java and run classes and stuff, which was not that much fun as it is now. Um, now you can just run bin log stash. There are a lot of contrib plugins, and you can also write your own if you fancy so, but I, yeah. You then need to go every step, and if something changes, you need to do all the hard work. Um, I never had the issue that we said, okay, it can do exactly that thing, we need to write it on our own, so you don't need to do that. And here come the daily indices. So on every, every midnight, it rolls over to a new index. And that's really cool because it's like a log file you log rotate every night and you have your data really clearly separated. We were talking about inputs. Um, you can have a file as an input. You can say log stash, listen on the syslog server port. Or you can also say, hey, I feed all my data into Redis, which we cover also lately, uh, later. Um, or you can get data from Logstash forwarder, which was Lumberjack for those which use it since quite a while. Um, covering some filters, um, you can use Grok, which is basically regex on steroids. You can have a Grok parser which goes through your logline and just name every part of it, and after naming them, they will be available as indexed entities of your, um, of your event. So that's really cool. Um, you can mutate things. You can remove, replace parts of your message. Um, you can drop things, like if you have just log messages, or one system is, uh, is sending also other things. You can find a way to say, OK, that's now, there is like a debug flag or something in it, and just drop them. You can clone them if you want to split them up in several directions. And you can, can do GUIP based on IP addresses. So you can, when you feed in all your access log, you can see in near real time where your traffic is coming from. That's really fun. If you think about it, when you have day and night and have a customer base on a website which is going, down, uh, going to the site 24-7, you see how the um, traffic is shifting. So that's really fun. And it also makes a big impression on the customer if you like, can say, oh, do you see the traffic or servers are handling? Like now they're coming from China, and now they're coming from the States, and stuff like that. There are also several outputs. So Elasticsearch, ha, that's why we're here. You can save it to a file, which is really, really cool if you want to have long-term storage, because you don't need to have any, uh, all your data in Elasticsearch all the time. You can drop it and import it later on. It just adds, I think you can easily compress a file and store it, then you can save 600 Elasticsearch indexes, so it makes it easier. There's also a neat thing, um, the S3 output. So you define, like, I want to save 50 Mac chunks to S3, and it, every time it hits the 50 Mac limit, it will flush it to a new file, and those 50 Macs, it will just upload them to S3, which is cool. Um, depends on your use case. If you want to have daily data, you probably might go with a file. Um, you can also move the data to Graphite or StatsD. So you can take out, a, for example, performance like a page load metric or a PHP render metric, or you render like a call, or you measure a call to a backend system, and then you just save that data and send just the, the time state, uh, the time it took to do the request to Graphite or StatsD, which is also cool. So looking at the configuration file, they all look like this. So you define an input, for example, standard in. You define an output with a codec Ruby debug. And when you start Logstash, you can say very important log message, and it will output that. That's not doing a lot of things currently. But it gives you an impression how the lock um, or the configuration part is done. You can also say, OK, I want to have 
it outputted to Elasticsearch, which listens on, the, on your local host, and you also want to split it to standard out, just for debugging reasons. Do that. That's a time saver. If you have, like, if you start to parse things, like Drupal error messages, and it goes to multi-lines or something like that, you definitely need that. And you will try, like, just copy the, the watchdog error message and paste it in your terminal and see what, what it does. There are also tools I showcase later on which help you in doing that. Um, yeah, I have another, there is another uh, snippet. You can say, I have the syslog files uh, and the start position is beginning, so every time you start logstash, it will go to the top and run through. It also, under, if you, there's another start position which, which saves where it was, and when it starts again, it will just continue where it was, which is also really cool. So, Kibana. Who knows Kibana since the early days? Who loved it in the early days? Well, okay. So, Kibana now looks like this, which is awesome. But looking at the, uh, the history of programming languages it was written in, looks like somebody had a lot of fun. So they started with Ruby. Then he said, okay, let's write it in PHP. Then he wrote it in just JavaScript, which was like, awesome. You can just get clone it, and you're gone. You're done. You can use it, which was awesome. Now it's a Node web server, and yeah. You need to install a lot of things again, and if you have a PHP setup, it's like it's not that easy as just having something. The not so easy part comes with a lot of benefits, which is it's based on D three JS, which adds a lot of fanciness to your graphs. So that's cool. Um, there is a more complex backend. It needs to know something about your data, and if you start it the first time, it asks you some questions. How are you? Um, are your indexes called, and when are you rolling them over? Just to that the Node application can talk better to Elasticsearch. You have a much better flexibility, which is when you come from Kibana three, a little bit overkill because you just with Kibana three you could just like do everything, click to click it together, and you were good. And now you need to um, like write some filters and think about it more in a more detailed way than you did. Um, but you can do a lot of analytics and you can also aggregate stuff. stuff. You can just um, have more facets in your search and you can do those nice um, pie charts with like two charts overlapping, which looks really cool, but I, don't, I didn't find any idea how to use them yet, so that's something. So enough of Kibana, let's go to the architecture part. Um, architecture is pretty simple. So what we use currently, we use syslog on every web server to ship data to a so-called broker. Broker is in our setup the logstash. Logstash parses the data, like breaks the log line up in to several fields and sends it to Elasticsearch, which then does the indexing and the, ser the save or the storage of the file. Uh, but Bastion just say, that's nice, but how are we going to make that highly available? Because if something breaks down here, it's like you just lose data because your syslog is happily sending out data and it just vanishes somewhere because it's a UDP package and they are not tracked in any way. So let's go to the real deal. To do that, we need another tool. So the whole thing is a big puzzle of simple, small tools which do exactly what you want, which is a really Unixy way of doing so. But we need Logstash forward. It's written in Go just to add some spice to your to your setup. Um, but it's really lightweight, lightweight, and it's just a thing that you point to a file and say ship it to my um, to my Logstash instance. It really, really uses not a lot of resources if you compare it to having a full-blown Logstash running on your servers. So it's just you don't think about it. Um, 
it uses TS, uh, TLS SSL encryption, and you need to have a real certificate. If you self-sign it, you will probably uh, go to Stack Overflow, then you will find some Reddit posts, and then you will swear and drink some coffee and be sad, and you just need a right uh, certificate. Or you need a CA running which it can authenticate to. So that's something I was working on. It's like, okay, let's just use our company certificate because it's easier and it works. So the architecture now looks like this. Um, we start with the same, we have the logstash forwarder instead of syslog. And then we have several logstash instances which take on the data. We save this data to Redis, and from Redis it goes to Logstash, which does the indexing and saves it to Elasticsearch. Done. Okay, now, from here it can go crazy. So, actually it looks like this. Um, it's the same in the beginning. You just send the data from Logstash forwarder to Logstash, and Logstash just sends the data further to Redis. So if you just take out one indexer node, the other one will take over, which is neat. But if you have been to the session about moving Molom to AWS, I guess, who was there? Well, that's mostly of your, yeah, it's all of them. So um, we weren't a lot of people, so we did a small exercise of how to do highly available things. So the Logstash will just take over because one Redis is f uh, fi filling up and that's the way. So done. But Bastion, is that really the solution of all problems? Simple answer? No, it isn't. So bear with me, um, we spice it up a little bit more because um, the thing is, Logstash forwarder can deal with, okay, I can't send data now, I just stash it and know where I, what I could send successfully the last time, so we are safe on that side. For the shipper part, we use KeepAlifeD, which behind KeepAlifeD we have two HA proxies running in TCP mode, which then just load balance the data to our Logstashs behind. So if one dies, we just move the IP over to the other one, and we're good. So every part of the system can take over if we need to do that. So, And the indexer part does the same thing as we did earlier. So if you just restart um, Redis, the data will go through the other one. Or we will have checks. We have checks which ensure that Redis runs behind and just remove it from the rotation. So that's what you can do. It's a, re, a really cool setup, but it, it's for a use case where you would really want to have that. If you don't care about losing five minutes of data when you just restart the server, fine, just go with a really easy setup and don't do that because it adds a lot of complexity. So you've been warned, you can use that. Let's talk about tools. Um, you saw a lot of screenshots earlier, so there is one called Elasticsearch Head, which was the go-to tool when I started, which was, like, wow, I see, I see indexes, I see shards, it can close and open them. It looked awesome. Um, below you see the command how to install it, but stop here, don't write this down. There is, if you translate Head, which is English, obviously, uh, into German, then it, says Kopf, and suddenly the plugin is Elasticsearch Kopf. Um, people, I don't know, they do things. And that's really cool. So it basically does the same thing, but you can do more. If you want to um, move a shard to another server, you just click on it, and then it, you have a little um, tick there, and you can just move the data to another shard and look in real time your how your data is moved across servers, which is really awesome. Um, you have also a console, you can type commands and do stuff. So that's really the tool you want to use. If you have an issue with load, you also see there's the, the red thing there, that's the load, which it shouldn't be red, it should be green, but I had quite some load when I did screenshots, so yeah. 
And you can also over, have an overview over how your cluster does. And if you want to do some maintenance, you usually move data away from this cluster, uh, uh, from this cluster node, and then reboot the instance. So you can, at one website, you see how your setup is doing. That's one tool I really tell you to use. Another thing is Curator. So um, since everything is scriptable by, by an API, um, you probably want to clean up because having a lot of data in your system and you probably don't want to um, have everything present. Like we just have the data accessible for the last seven days. And if we want to have more, we just open the index, indexes again because open indexes also need some RAM and file system. Um, space. So yeah, that's the thing. Um, curator helps you in doing so. So you can say, I want to close indexes. I want to delete indexes. You can also say, I want to uh, delete everything that's older than 10 days or everything that's bigger than 100 gigabytes. That's really cool. You can disable the bloom filter, which nobody tells you to do so, but I do. Um, the bloom filter will use a lot of RAM for indexes which are open because it's a filter which is used when you index data. As we have time series indexes, you won't use that filter on every index older than a day because you won't enter data there. So you can easily disable them. Um, you can optimize it or in um, Elasticsearch, uh, Elasticsearch terms, say, if do a force merge. Um, I did it once and it just used a lot of RAM and a lot of uh, CPU and yeah, it didn't change a lot so I don't use it. Um, it's all on GitHub. It's a script you can run and it runs really nice outputs. So Curator is perfect for, for time series indexes. Don't try to build your own because it does everything out of the box. Um, that's how I run um, like close indexes older than 14 days, delete everything that's older than 30 days, you just run it and you're good. Or the second one is close the uh, indexes which are older than 40 days, uh, 14 days, disable the bloom filter which is older than two days because you have time zones and it gets creepy at some point, um, and delete everything that's older than 30 days. Of course, it creates a log which you could also feed into your setup and do the elastic exception. So that's cool. Another thing, if you're really into Java, is Big Desk. Um, it gives you a lot of inform detailed information about how the Java processes are doing, how, yeah. Bear with me, I love it sometimes, yeah. We talked about grok filters. They look like this. That's an ugly one. Uh, that's basically, I guess, a production filter. Um, no, 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 it isn't. Um, but you will start writing those filters, and you will start swearing. Um, and there is a really easy solution to that, which is called the grok debugger. So you copy-paste a log line, and you copy-paste your, um, your grok filter you wrote, and it will output what grok can do which is awesome because when you do, when you do it like, like I started, I was s writing my config file, saving it, starting Logstash, typing something, seeing that it fails, breaking down the Java process, doing the process again, and it was like tiring. And here it's just like, oh, okay, I need that, and I need that, and you just lace it together, and in the end it will work fine. It doesn't do everything perfectly, but it helps you to save time. If you're into reading, um, buy the Logstash book. I didn't write it, unfortunately, um, but it's the best $10 you can pay for a book on that uh, matter. It has all the HA stuff in, so it goes from having one node to having a dozens of nodes and uh, how you can like scale it up, and it goes really into detail. Um, Elasticsearch self, or Elastic, made um, a really huge effort. They wrote a small book, um, the definitive guide um, to, to Elasticsearch, which is awesome because you have on every single nitty gritty detail of Elasticsearch, you can find a big write up what it does. Sometimes it's okay, I just wanted to know if I should set it to true or false, but thank you for all the information. So yeah. 
Another topic I want to cover is the performance optimization, short P22N. Um, remember, guys, it's Java. So Java needs memory, and it needs I.O., and it needs files. So um, since we have a lot of files stored on the disk, you need a lot of file descriptors to, to have it open. So it can happen that when you say, okay, I want to have data from the last 60 days, and I want to have this filter, and you just hit enter, that your server just says, I can't do that. So be sure that you raise the file descriptors. Um, also, be sure that you have enough memory, but not more than 30.2 gigabytes. There is a link down there which explains why not. Just don't go over 30.2. And try to leverage the file system cache. Because everything, um, because it's based on Apache Lucene, it leverages the file system cache. So the rule of thumb is that you just use half of the memory you have on the server for the Elasticsearch, and the other half will be file system cache, which they also write down in exact detail how you should do it. That's the, the, the short overview how you can do performance. There are a lot of blog posts, and I will also um, publish a small blog post tomorrow um, on my blog um, with all the, the references I took in here, so it's definitely worth a read. Automation. Who does Puppet? Okay. I'm sorry, I just checked for Puppet because now I'm doing Puppet, so there wasn't really no reason to check Ansible and Salt and whatever. So if you do Puppet, there are three really good, um, okay, two really good things. Elastic, to install Elasticsearch, um, use that module. It's awesome. It just works out of the box, and you don't have to think about a lot of things. Logstash Forward also works good. Logstash itself, it's like, yeah, you need to define parts of your config file and get them together. I didn't like that too much. So that's a short write-up how I um, provision my test lab. So you just say, give me an elastic search with the correct repo. Say you want to manage the repo. Um, also say install Java, because if you set it to false, it will just say, okay, can't start. Yeah. Um, you can easily define the cluster and the data deer, and then you're, you can go. It's really easy with those um, things. If you want to have more instances, you can just copy the second part of it and just have more instances on one server, which it doesn't speak against it, but it's like there is no reason to do so. So it should be a separate server. For testing, it works. You can run several instances on one machine. Yeah. So what can you take home from my talk? So centralized logging saves a lot of time because you don't write a lot of shell things together to get the data your boss wants from you. So that helps a lot. It's fun with the Elasticsearch stack because um, in the early days you need to put everything together and now it's like it's a solid block of one tool which every tool you use has a really um, easy way to use it and you can, it's, it's a dense package of tools but you can use it in a pr pretty awesome way. Um, it gives you graphs to interpret which are really much easier than checking log files. And the question about the log files between two, uh, two after three and seven after three gets a lot easier to do. And if people say, okay, now I want to have it like from yesterday and from yesterday and whatever, and a month before, you can just do it when you have the data. So for starting, I suggest to use the um, getting started with Logstash. I see there is a typo in it. It should be 172. Um, but it's, it's redirecting you probably to the right version. So there is a really good guide written by um, Logstash, the Logstash people, which show you how to get to the end setup we discussed. So all I say, thank you for having me here. It's been a pleasure talk, talking to you, and I'm happy to answer questions if there are some.
Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, Red, thank you for that question. Um, so Redis does the buffering of your files. So you could use any system which is able to buffer files, like um, RabbitMQ, for example, as a queuing system. Since we had Redis already in our setup, it was an easy guess to say, okay, we have Redis, we can use, reuse that part, and not trying to spin up um, a Redi um, RabbitMQ. So it's the part where you just, you have a bucket you can just fill data in, and you have uh, log stashes who take the data out um, and parse them. So that's the, the part where you just buffer data if you have a lot of data. Does that? You could send it directly, but then um, if you have a spike um, in, in traffic, for example, if you parse the access files, um, probably your elastic, so, no, your uh, log stash processes get overloaded and can't deal with the traffic. That's an edge case, but Redis is memory speed, so you can go pretty fast. So, yeah. Okay, um, I just rephrase it for the um, recording. So the question was, um, how are you detecting that you need to scale up your Redis because you get a lot of data? Um, well, honestly, I, ne I didn't yet reach that case, um, but you should monitor the, the usage of Redis, like how many space you have left. Because Redis behaves pretty strange when it reaches the end of its memory. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I would just monitor it and send an alert if you reach the end. Or having a setup which can, like, spawn another um, log stash process to process more data out of Redis. But um, currently, the old setup we have just runs on one, LS, uh, one log stash process running as um, syslog, and we never had issues. Not even in times when we were analyzing data um, from the Swiss television, which have quite a lot of traffic in some, uh, at some points when they have live shows. So we never had that issue. Um, it scales fairly well, so to say. Does that answer your question? No. Thanks. Yes? I didn't. Um, well, the question was if I tried to use it with Java 8. I didn't. I just, um, the last time I tried it, I was just saying the Puppet recipe to install Java. So I'm not really sure which version came with it. So that's definitely something to try out. We have. You have. Wow. Okay. And the other is to hate the spike recommendations from the last conference. Um, and basically. Wow, okay. So basically we were discussing about using Java seven or eight. So they run into issues with uh, with Java seven indexing a lot of file uh, a lot of data and just switching over to Java eight solved everything. So it's not yet recommended by Elastic. So probably that's one. That's probably one tip they say if you have the paying subscription, like oh you have issues, just upgrade to Java eight. So, yeah, um, I guess they will support it sooner or later. So, but thank you for that hint. Other questions? Do you have any recommendation about um, the index and normalization? I mean, Star should realize that this should be an easier to write repository. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so the question is basically, um, 
how do you deal with uh, changing applications that report to it and being able to process data which you probably didn't think about when you started out. That's correct, right? Yeah. So one thing I heard last week is like data you don't have hurts the most. So what I do, I when we started out with doing Elasticsearch and logging, um, we were dropping everything that's older than 10 days. Then people found out that it's pretty handy to tell the customer that they deleted their stuff and not we did it. So the first case was like 14 days, and they said like, okay, yeah, um, can you please uh, do the... Um, the check again, and I was like, no, I dropped data after 10 days because it's a work site project and it's not like by any means meant to be productive. So um, then I said, okay, we just store the data for 300 days, um, which also means when you have changes and you want to have something analyzed, it creates a lot of pain. So what I would suggest is that you split it in a file and archive the file and if you just add things or you just think about things you will need, you just add them already and you can parse them afterwards. You can just re-index the file again. So that would be an idea. Or um, just try to think about use cases and if you want to add it, just add it proactively. But there is no way of, unless you dump a whole chunk uh, of data of uh, specifics about your application in it, you can save them proactively, but it will just use a lot of power. So it's really hard to, to say what to take in. Um, I can also post a link to some slides. Uh, I was attending the uh, Elasticsearch meetup last week, and they have a really good um, example of what, all, what specifics of their application they track. And they also say if we forget something or if we add something, we just add it then. But they have like a really big set of around 10 to 15 metrics they track, but they say, ah, oh, we don't need it yet. But if we want to have it, we have it ready. So that's the, the best advice I can give. Does that help? Wonderful. Other questions? Okay. Um, one last thing. Uh, there are sprints on Friday, and you're really, really welcome to join, as you heard, Dries. We want to try to get that Drupal 8 out of the door soon. So feel free to join. Um, there will be people helping you. Thank you again for attending.